Hello, <clears throat> uh, my name is uh, Mark Little. I'm VP of Engineering at Red Hat, and I have the uh, pleasure this year of giving the uh, JFK keynote. So uh, I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so uh, taking you through some of the exciting things happening in the world of Java today, which I believe can be useful in trying to predict the future direction of the language and the frameworks or stacks that are implemented with, with Java. Um, I've actually seen the entire JFK agenda, and I'm pleasantly surprised to see that uh, several of these topics I'm only going to be able to touch on are actually getting a much deeper dive uh, later on. So please do stay for the entire event, and I'm sure you'll learn so much more. All right, so with that in mind, let's begin. So um, it probably goes without saying, because you're all attending a conference uh, about Java, you know, that is the J uh, in the title. But I think we'll definitely continue to see the adoption of Java grow far beyond you know, its original uh, use cases. Now, if you're a Back to the Future fan, you'll hopefully recognize uh, this, this picture and you'll know that at that point in the film, you know, Doc Brown had come back from the heady future of 2015 and said that flying cars were the norm. Well, I'm hoping that I'm better at predicting the future than you know, he was. One last thing. Uh, the other letter in the conference is K, which stands for Kubernetes. And as you'll see in, in my session and in uh, many of the others today, cloud and Java should be close friends. And if you're talking about cloud today, then you pretty much need to factor Kubernetes or Kube uh, into the equation. All right, so <clears throat> because of that, you know, I think it's fair to say that in the last few years, we've seen a transition from talking just about cloud native to, to kube native. And I think it's also important to understand that whilst the latter, that is Kubernetes native, implies cloud native, the inverse isn't always the case. So something which is cloud native isn't necessarily kube native. And we'll definitely touch on that uh, in my uh, slides to come. But you know, if you do a search for Kubernetes native Java, Java today, as I did, um, when I was presenting this, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, uh, cook the books in any way, uh, you'll get pages of hits for quarkers. And that's no surprise since we coined the term, but it's nice to now see other vendors and communities starting to embrace it. And what do we need? What do we really mean by, by Kubernetes Java then? Well, uh, as I put up here, you know, I think Quarkus is definitely a good example. And yes, I know I could be accused of, of being subjective and there absolutely is some subjectiveness here. I, I love, I love Quarkus. Um, but in case you're not aware of what Quarkus is though, I, I want to put this slide up. Uh, hopefully you haven't been under a rock for, uh, for too long, but it, uh, if, you, you know, if you want to understand a little bit more about Quarkus, there are some sessions later on, but definitely go and take a look at the community site. And you'll see that since we released Quarkus over two years ago, it's won quite a few awards and in many ways helped to inject some much needed mojo into the Java language and, and frameworks. But that doesn't really help to answer the question, what is Kubernetes uh, Java? Um, and especially as more communities adopt the term Kubernetes native, I think it's important to have a baseline definition. And I think the one that we're gonna have here on this slide is, is a pretty good one. Uh, but, you know, we'll need to build on it. If you look at traditional Java, for instance, which has definitely dominated the enterprise uh, space since, um, since it was released in you know, 96, 97, Java ha and the JVM have been heavily optimized over those years to get great throughput. You know, it's why many enterprise systems uh, started to use it and continue to use it today. But it is at the expense of footprint. You know, Java, when it first began, it, the, the kind of mantra was just give me all the memory that you've got on this computer and you know, I'll release it when you kill the JVM. And you know, as we all know as well, Java has got some great dynamic aspects to it, like you know, traditional object-oriented interface into implementation, separation, class loaders, et cetera. So it's fantastic for mutable environments where the application is going to run for months at a time and can't be shut down. You know, if any of you have been in the space long enough uh, to have used uh, and continue to use maybe application servers, you'll know that you know, not shutting down your app server uh, 10, 15 years ago was you know, the, the thing that we tried to optimize for because 
typically it took a long time to restart the application server because of some of the aspects that had gone into their architecture, but also because of the Java language itself. So having a, a system that you could uh, patch on the fly became key to, to the language and to the frameworks and stacks that were built on it in this kind of traditional manner. However, Kubernetes has inbuilt immutability assumptions. For instance, you know, if a Linux container image, which Kubernetes uh, typically uh, manages and deploys, if that needs updating, then generate a new Im image and deploy that. Don't go changing the running image. And much of Java in that environment isn't strictly necessary. It can actually get in the way and slow things down. So hopefully, again, uh, you're not going to be taken by surprise here that, uh, well, I think I might have skipped. Nope. This is a typical Java framework. Yeah, sorry, I think I thought I'd skipped a couple of slides. So um, this is typically how we have built and deployed applications for you know, 20, 20 plus years. You download what you need from Maven uh, or from you know, internal repo somewhere. Uh, a lot of um, you know, runtime configuration is then uh, left to lazy evaluation. You can span, uh, you know, uh, scan your class path, find out what classes are actually in the jars. Uh, maybe get new classes sent to you in the app server model I mentioned earlier, for instance, and actually patch the system that's running. So a lot of a lot of what goes into these applications is left to to runtime, uh, which means typically you have to keep a lot of extra classes in memory that you may never need, uh, particularly if you're running for weeks or months at a, at a time. In a Kubernetes native way, what we try to do. Uh, and this is not something that's just specific to Quarkus, I'm trying to be a bit more objective now, is we try and push a lot of that configuration to build time. So make the decision about which implementation you want for your interface, for instance, at build time. Don't leave it till, till lazy evaluation. Create an immutable image. And like I said, if you need to change that later on because you have to patch the, the, the implementation class, you know, you want to um, you know, tweak something or, or do a bug fix or a, or, or a CVE, for instance, create another, um, another um, container instance that Kubernetes can use. Do not do much at runtime, do it as much as you possibly can uh, at build time. And this helps to, uh, to optimize the application significantly, as we'll see. Now, we can do a lot of optimization of Java the JVM and frameworks to squeeze more performance and application density into Kubernetes native uh, deployments by, by doing some of these techniques, by optimizing at build time rather than runtime. However, the, there is one additional tool which came along a few years uh, ago, and it's, it's also a game changer, I think, in this kind of environment, and that is GraalVM. And I'm sure that uh, you know, many of you listening to me talk will have heard of Graal, if not actually used it. Uh, it's become incredibly uh, popular, like I said, over the last the last few years. And Graal itself is quite big. Uh, it's polyglot, uh, so it's not just uh, not just Java. Um, you can run it uh, on Android. Um, the team are doing some incredibly good work on on other areas of um, of, of um, languages, not just Java or Ruby or JavaScript, for instance. Uh, but where I'm concerned at this point for this for this talk and probably for a few of the other sessions that you'll hear later on, we are just really focusing on on what they have provided for um, for Java and for for what's becoming known as as native Java. So, um, you know, as I said, Graal is a key part of what we at least uh, in in Quarkus. Uh, like to factor into our efforts around creating kube native applications, but it does uh, come with some some trade offs. For instance, um, it, because it creates a, a native image, it, clearly you don't have the portability. You no longer have the build once run everywhere that you know we all come to 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 expect with Java for twenty five years. There are other aspects that don't work well or as easily with Graal, like reflection. So there are pros and cons. So therefore, whilst it's important to have GraalVM uh, or native Java. Like I said, it's kind of becoming known as, uh, as that, or at least the, the concept is becoming more known as, as native uh, Java. 
uh, so while it's important to have them in the picture, the traditional Java machine still has a key role to play for many, many applications. You know, I'll, I'll repeat this, uh, what I said a few minutes ago, but because Java and the JVM have been around for so long, there's so many um, you know, hours of, of collective work have gone into tuning the JVM, tuning stacks for long running applications that uh, even compared to some you know, more, uh, other languages like C or C++, it's it's hard to beat uh, Java running in the JVM for long durations of, of, of time. So ruling out the Open, J, Open JDK for Kubernetes is, is simply not uh, not worth it. Uh, it does have a, a significant uh, role to play in Kubernetes deployments. So um, I know there's at least one more session uh, on Quarkus later on uh, today. Uh, I think given by Jason Green, uh, one of the original uh, founders of Quarkus. So I won't go into too much more detail and, and potentially steal his his thunder. But I did want to say, you know, if you look at some of the things I mentioned before, uh, like Graal and optimizing uh, with ahead of time compilation and considering uh, re-architecting your applications to think about immutability, uh, you can see some significant performance improvements in application density, so memory footprint uh, to, to you and I, and performance. And you might have seen some of these figures uh, before, um, particularly where people have been talking about Quarkus, or you may have seen similar ones from, from other efforts. But you know, if we just look at one, for instance, just the one on the far left here, reducing memory footprint, the, the gray boxes is meant to represent your typical uh, traditional cloud native stack where it's optim it's not optimized uh, for immutability. So it's probably got class loaders in, it's leaving a lot of things to, to run time, carrying a lot of baggage along, even if it's not necessarily needed. So that's that kind of footprint there. But then if you use um, just Quarkus and you optimize for doing everything or as much as you possibly can at build time and you run just on open jdk i know it says jvm here but it's it's, it's open jdk you can shrink that down by roughly 50 percent if you then factor in uh, native java uh, aka graal in this uh, example you can take that even further so that's you know maybe um i don't know 20 percent of of the uh, the blue box and you get similar thing, uh, performance improvements for you know for startup time and um, you know disk footprint. So this is you know an incredibly important way of of evolving Java and, and the frameworks to take into account the expectations of Kube native uh, uh, clouds, public and private and hybrid, which are pretty much becoming the dominant uh, uh, example. So I did want to say though um, this. So this um, diagram here is from a, a survey of uh, serverless languages. Uh, I think it was uh, looking at Amazon and, and Microsoft at the time. It's a little old, so uh, 2019, but it still shows at, you know, at that time, some of the hurdles that we need to surmount. You know, serverless uh, is already a, you know, a key tool in many, many developers' toolboxes. And if Java is not part of that as well, then you know not only are we doing a, a disservice to our developer, develop, to our developers and communities, but we you know we risk um, you know, marginalizing Java in an incredibly important area. And and if we marginalize Java in serverless, it'll probably get marginalized eventually in in what might be non-serverless or traditional cloud. And you know lots of things will then have to be re-implemented. And whilst things should be re-implemented if they're you know not necessarily a good fit, I do think that Java, with some of the techniques I've mentioned earlier, absolutely is a good fit. We just need to think slightly more out of the box uh, a little bit here. Okay, so um, what is you know what is Kubernetes then, um, or what is Kubernetes, Kubernetes native Java? Well, for the sake of time, uh, I won't go through all of these uh, bullet points uh, directly. But suffice it to say that uh, at last year's J4K, uh, John Klingen, who uh, works for Red Hat and in one of his many guises is uh, he, he's uh, representative on for Red Hat on Eclipse Micro Profile, and has also been the uh, the uh, PM for for Quarkus. <clears throat> he gave a, a really good presentation on uh, Kubernetes native Java and 
some of the points that uh, he thought you know would would help to define that term things like you know open metrics kubernetes client apis health endpoints incredibly important to be able to tell whether something is running or not um and you know the second last bullet here uh tuned for 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 serverless essentially or functions as a service so uh if you want to get a bit more information i'm sure that we will hear some more in the next day uh of presentations anyway but i could thoroughly recommend if you dive back into some of the JFK 2020 sessions and especially John Klingon's. Now, all of this so far is, I think, incredibly exciting as it shows how Java can still be relevant in this new cloud or, or Kube uh, world. It also shows, I think, that the Java communities are tackling the use cases seriously and, and not ignoring things. You know, if you consider where we were as a community only a few short years ago with cloud and with people like that serverless survey suggesting Java is just not relevant uh, in the cloud. It's you know it's for monoliths. It's uh, for your your old world uh, applications. And then you look at where we are today. I think it's been an incredibly fast and iterative journey. But there's there's more. Now, I'm sure many of you will have heard of, if not used, uh, adopt OpenJDK. So this was an effort that was kicked off a few years ago by IBM, the London Java community, and others, uh, essentially as a central place where you could go to download uh, OpenJDK binaries, and they were also uh, building or are building those binaries on a number of different architectures. And they're making sure that the binaries they built are tested and patched safely and in a timely manner. And adopt OpenJDK, I think, <clears throat> by any metric, has been incredibly successful and you know i i think it's in a way it's surprising that it took us 20 years to realize we probably needed something like this you know other languages have had a, a, a repository where you can go and get uh, you know a, a, a blessed uh, set of images that everybody can share and and now we finally have that with uh, with open jdk or with adopt open jdk well last year uh, we, and I use the adopt OpenJDK uh, community to mean that, uh, we decided to move it to the uh, Eclipse Foundation. And as part of that, you know, it underwent a, a name change and that became uh, Eclipse Adoptium. Pretty much the same kind of uh, reasoning behind it, so, so not too much changes. Um, one of the things that we have seen that, that's changed in a, a very positive way, obviously, is that the working group has expanded. So. Now Alibaba is involved, Azul, uh, Huawei, uh, Microsoft, for instance, is, is also involved. Uh, <clears throat> there are um, you know, almost 300 million downloads of Adopt uh, OpenJDK binaries and, uh, and, and Adoptium. Um, I'm gonna to touch on a, a couple of these other bullets as well in a second, uh, Eclipse Aquavit uh, and Eclipse uh, Temerin which is a build that the ADOPT um, project does. Uh, like I said before, it works on, uh, or targets, sorry, um, various Linux variants, Windows, Mac, and different architectures. And that has always been one of the key things for ADOPT. It's not just looking at producing a Windows build or producing a, uh, a RHEL, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux build, for instance. You can, you, know, you can get those from Red Hat or you can get, could get those from, from Microsoft. It's uh, a place where you can get all of your architectures, hopefully, are, are going to be covered here. So um, what about uh, Aquavit? Well, uh, Aquavit, Aquavit is part of um, Eclipse Adoptium, and it's an attempt to ensure that all of the binaries that are produced by that community pass a quality bar. Uh, I want to say up front, this is not the same as the uh, as the TCK or, or the, the the JCK. Um, that's uh, also an imp an important uh, brand, uh, and many many uh, builds of OpenJDK, uh, you know, past the JCK. But Adoptium, as well as Adopt OpenJDK before it, have never tied these things together, and this allows for other other. Uh, um, vendors or, or communities to to provide their own bills, and then what do you, then what do you do? You know, how do you make sure that they passed some, like I said, some kind of uh, bare uh, baseline that they are good enough to be used 
by developers or even potentially in uh, in deployments in, in enterprise um, use cases. And that's that's pretty much what Acrovit is about. Uh, I think if you didn't notice it before on the previous slide, uh, over a quarter of a million tests have gone into Acrovit so far. It's like like all good vibrant open source communities, you know, it's a it's a live thing. The teams, the communities are adding to this uh, on a on a regular basis, focusing the tests on cloud native and Kube native, looking at you know new areas that they can improve on, uh, and and I can only see this uh, growing in uh, in importance. So there's a lot of good things uh, coming out of uh, uh, um, Eclipse Foundation's Adoptium effort, and an Acrobit uh, tend, tends to be probably one of my one of my favorites. All right, so something else to let you know about. Um, and this is called Cruise uh, Autotune. And uh, I, I love this. Uh, it's not part of the Eclipse Foundation, uh, but nevertheless, you know, it is you know, entirely open source. So if you go and Google uh, Cruise Autotune, you, you should find it uh, pretty easily. Um, the team behind it have been working on this for a number of years, first in IBM, and then, then they moved across uh, into Red Hat. The aim here is, uh, as hopefully you can see on the slide, to try and use you know, AI machine learning techniques to take a goal that you, you've defined, like uh, you know, I, need it to, I need my application to respond within a certain uh, num uh, number of milliseconds and scale to a certain number of instances, for instance, um, and auto automatically or in, you know, as soon as you put AI and ML in there, I think it's more automatically, tune your application, monitor it and retune it, uh, and, and including the JVM. So it's, it's not just tuning the JVM and it's not just tuning the, the application, it's trying to tune the whole stack. And, and to do so in a manner which, which conforms to the goal that you set. Um, so if you've ever struggled with tuning your applications, you know, try and, uh, trial and error uh, is, is often the way I've seen communities or, or, or customers try it uh, over the years. Something like Cruise Autotune uh, is is going to help there uh, immensely. So, you know, if you haven't looked at it, if you have something in mind that sounds similar, take a look at it. Maybe it's uh, an area where you could get involved. You could either use it or start to contribute to it. But I think as we scale our applications up onto uh, onto the cloud and into Kube, for instance, things like Cruise Autotune, where um, we're having more autonomous systems are going to be more and more important. So this is hopefully this is just the tip of the iceberg that we'll see with this kind of AI ML uh, integration with our with our stacks and frameworks, particularly in the in the Java space. All right. So if you look back on what I just mentioned in the past, you know, ten plus slides, hopefully you'll see that there is an incredibly rich and diverse cloud native Java ecosystem now. I deliberately said at the start, you know, difference between cloud native and Kube native. Here I am talking about cloud native again, uh, because what we want to do with things like Adoptium or, you know, even, you know, uh, Cruise Autotune is um, we want to support um, more than just uh, Kubernetes based clouds. <clears throat> uh, despite the fact that, you know, Kube is pretty much the dominant, there are, you know, there are non Kube uh, environments out there. And it would definitely be remiss of, of the wider Java community to, to ignore them. So a lot of what I've just talked about, and hopefully this slide tries to convey, is, is not just specific to, to Kube. Kube is a, is a key first-class citizen, but there are you know, optimizations going on in Graal, in OpenJDK, you know, in, like I said, in Cruise Autotune, which would allow you to use these uh, tools or frameworks in non-Kube uh, environments. But I think the, the important thing I'm trying to get through here to, to anybody is that, again, it's very, very rich ecosystem. The communities are you know, coming together and putting a lot of effort into this, which is, which is fantastic to see. So you know, we've spoken a bit about native Java in the context of GraalVM, but there are other pro approaches uh, coming. Or, or even available now, and I wanted to just give you a you know a, a little uh, snippet of, of of them in the last few minutes. <clears throat> so you know I did say I think GraalVM has been a great catalyst, and certainly from a Red Hat Quark's point of view, a fantastic partner. So you know, lots of thanks to the Oracle Labs folks. 
Um, we have our own packaging in case anybody is, is interested called Mandrel. Essentially, it's our productized build of the upstream community. You can find that uh, through that link there. But there still needs to be work done by the wider Java community. So Graal VM is just one implementation uh, and it's a, you know, it's a specific vendor's implementation. You might want, you know, in good open source uh, uh, way or good standards way to have multiple implementations so you can, you know, pick and choose. So last year um, under OpenJDK, it was announced that there will be a, a project called Laden, which will attempt to define uh, native Java or static Java um, and be a reference implementation for that. Now, Graal VM work will, will clearly feed into this, uh, but hopefully Project Laden will then become the, the, the new catalyst for how we do a lot more innovation in this, in this space. Um, one other thing to, to mention that was released in the last uh, couple of weeks is something called Cubic from, from Red Hat. Uh, this is uh, our own uh, implementation of, of native Java that uh, we've been working on for, for quite a while. So Red Hat and, and IBM, and we wanted to open source it to let people uh, you know, look at it, pick it apart, maybe even contribute to it a little bit. It's, the aim is to try and capture a lot of rapid prototyping work on native images. It's definitely more an experimental sandbox. Uh, I, I like to think that some of what we're learning, some of the lessons we've learned from Cubic and we'll continue to learn from it, will feed into Laden as well. Uh, it's different from Graal and, and Laden in that it has no specific JVM, uh, or it's not dependent on a specific JVM. And, and a lot of it is actually written in uh, Java itself. Okay, so um, I thought I'd just plug Quarkus one more time. Uh, I'm pretty sure um, Jason will probably touch on this a little bit more, but Quarkus 2 is coming. Uh, you'll see a lot of improvements in, in it uh, when we release it uh, imminently. Um, focuses on you know, uh, reactive improvements, new version of Vertex is in there, Rest Easy Reactive, if you haven't looked at that. Uh, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but it's been in experimental phase for a while. It's not going to be experimental. Some key reactive changes to hibernate as well for performance around databases, they're going to be in that. So stick around and hopefully Jason will say a little bit more about that. So uh, in, in conclusion, I just want to say that you know, I think if you look at everything that's that's going on, it, things I've touched on, things I probably haven't even had time to, uh, to touch on in this Kube native uh, Java space, uh, the Java ecosystem and communities and vendors have absolutely accepted the challenge and stepped up and are, you know, to coin a phrase, you know, knocking it out of the park. Um, I think if you look at your Java applications today and if you're thinking about moving them to the cloud, you should absolutely consider just jumping straight to making them Kube native. Uh, it's probably gonna give you a lot longer uh, lifetime with them. Uh, lots of new frameworks coming up now that are embracing these same techniques. Uh, and it's, it's great to see that the adoption in these, uh, not just Quarkus is, is growing. Uh, we're now as a result seeing, you know, um, Kube native, uh, frameworks and, and stacks being used a lot more in serverless and even even in uh, what, what I think people are now calling far edge, which, you know, five years ago, people were calling edge, but now edge is a little bit further in from the edge. So far edge is really the edge. Um, I did want to say one last time, you know, please stick around. Lots of good talks that are going to go into a little bit more detail than what I've been able to in this 30 minutes. Uh, and I'm sure you'll, you'll come away feeling uh, you know, energized and excited by lots of these things that are happening and maybe be able to, if not uh, contribute to them, hopefully you'll be able to use them and, and project your, your development efforts to that next level of, of Kubernetes native. Okay, so uh, I'll leave you with this one last slide and I think I'm pretty much on time. So if I stop sharing, I can maybe take some questions for five minutes. Okay, uh, so um, Q&A question that I can see, what's the difference between adopt open JDK and Adoptium? Just that one is Oracle and the other Eclipse. Uh, oh yeah, so <clears throat> uh, good, good question. So adopt open JDK, sorry, open JDK is 
the upstream community where all development around OpenJDK happens. So, you know, if you want to go uh, and you think you've got a great new idea for a garbage collector, uh, you would do that work in, in OpenJDK. Um, Project Laden that I mentioned earlier, that work is going to happen uh, in OpenJDK. Adopt OpenJDK and now Adoptium are not competitors with OpenJDK. So it's not like, uh, you know, the, the vendors on the communities behind Adopt, for instance, have forked the OpenJDK code and are now working on it in Adopt. Absolutely not. It's meant more as a, a supporting infrastructure, if you like, to what's going on in Adopt. So once, you know, once a release of Adopt uh, happens, sorry, once a release, release of OpenJDK happens, uh, they, they, they finalize, uh, you know, say Java 25, then, you know, the adopt OpenJDK team or the Adoptium team will look at that and we'll do builds and we'll make them available uh, on uh, Eclipse Adoptium. So hopefully that helps with the difference between OpenJDK and Adoptium. If I said adopt when I meant OpenJDK in my presentation, apologies. Um, sometimes these words, you know, just mingle up and get messed up. Uh, what is Java and Kubernetes doing to enhance security with shift left along with moving to pre runtime focus? Uh, good question. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer because I'm not entirely sure how to parse that. I would say that security is in, obviously incredibly important in any environment. Um, if you, you know, but it touches on a lot of different things. Uh, so security to one group might just be single sign-on, for instance. To another, it could be you know encrypting the messages uh, that flow between uh, distributed endpoints. So it's it's a hard question to answer because I don't really understand what you're asking there. What I would suggest is, if you look at something like Keycloak, for instance, um, upstream community Keycloak.io, I think um, you might actually get better answers on that question if you were to go there because Keycloak, we're we're working. To make it, you know, Kube native, uh, it's, it's integrated with Quarkus as, as well, and I know it's got a quite a large and popular developer community outside of Red Hat. So, although it's a Red Hat sponsored project, it's being used in a lot of different places. <clears throat> Any insights on Micronaut? Um, Micronaut is, you know, it's a another uh, Kube native uh, framework, uh, I believe. Probably the the more recent thing I've seen uh, around Micronaut is um, now I I know it's still it's still independent. I think Graham Rocher moved to Oracle, so he's now working for for Oracle. Uh, I don't know if he's in, in Oracle Labs or, or like the Oracle side of the house that does OpenJDK. So I, I you know apologies, Graham, um, and I believe that he's working to. Uh, integrate Micronaut with Heladon or vice versa. So that one of the things that uh, Micronaut didn't have was Eclipse micro profile support. I think that bringing the two things together is an attempt to do that, uh, but you'd be better off maybe asking somebody on the Micronaut uh, community about, about that. Uh, any comments on Project Loom? <laughs> um, so Project Loom, when it comes, yeah, it will not kill reactive. Uh, there is, there is one person who works for me that has probably a lot more to say about Project Loom and its impact on Reactive. Um, a, a guy called uh, Clement Escoffier. He's my Reactive architect. Um, and he's also uh, part of the, uh, the key Quarkus uh, team. Um, so you should definitely um, reach out to him if you, if, I think he might even come to JFK, but if he doesn't, please reach out to him on the, um, on the Quarkus, uh, website and the um and he's got a lot to say on that in fact he's got several presentations on that is there any consolidated resource focusing on red hat cloud native java focused work and project um another good question i'm not sure uh if you want to ping me offline i i know we have got uh, consolidated resources but i don't know if they're open um so uh you know it might be useful for you to reach out to me and i can see what i can make available uh, does Java have any enhancement to support concurrent running in clustered-based environments? 
uh, again, depends on what you mean by concurrent running. I mean, clearly you can run you can run multiple JVM instances today on multiple machines, on multiple clusters. Clustering has been in app servers for a long, long time, whether it's Wildfly uh, or um, other app servers like, like Liberty or WebSphere. Um, so there's clearly concurrent uh, uh, execution going on today, even before the move to, to Kubernetes. So I've just been told that the session is about to end. Um, thank you all very much for attending. Hopefully you got uh, something out of this and uh, you can reach out to me uh, separately if, uh, if you want any more from me. All right, thank you very much.